Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, back on the University of Ottawa campus where I did my PhD and where our guest today also did her PhD, Madeline Klosky. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. So you haven't been on in a couple years, I no. think. I think the last time you were here was uh, as the planes go over. We're outside. It's Thanksgiving Monday. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. We thought we'd sit outside and there's an old single engine plane that flies over downtown um, on nice days. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it was when we did the walk through the new Canada Hall. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been at least a couple years. At, at least. Yeah. So at that point, we had all graduated, right? Mm -hmm. We had already graduated. Yeah. Um, and now you are off to fame and fortune in the federal government. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you may have heard Madeline on the Evan Solomon show, oh, gosh. Uh, which was a great hit, I thought. Yeah. Uh, Evan Solomon liked it. Well, you know, I was doing my part for the public servants and their pay issues. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So Madeline uh, is one of the casualties of phoenix yes uh unfortunately i am too but not nearly in the same way that, that you were uh, it seems like pretty much everyone in this town even if they don't work for the government have had their faith screwed up by <laughs> phoenix somehow um, but we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about our grad school experiences because yes. we were at the same school at the same time mm -hmm. and you tweeted something uh, about a year ago yes. that uh, I've been thinking about ever since and, and <laughs> I've, I've wanted to talk to you about so the tweet from October 13 mm -hmm. 2018 interestingly maternity leave has allowed me to reflect on the worst part of my grad school experience isolation in reflection I regret bowing to the constant pressure to forego socializing in lieu of panicking over my thesis in solitude what an unhealthy environment Looking back, so many parts of grad school now make me cringe as many aspects of the intellectual environment as I experienced are established in such a way as to push vulnerable people into a mental health crisis, or excuse me, into mental health crises. Mm -hmm. Now having completed my PhD and being on the other side, it's made me hyper vigilant to potential situations where similarly unrealistic and ridiculous pressures may reside and made me conscious of the need to avoid such pitfalls. So in that way, I gained a real life skill. And the thread goes on um, <laughs> to talk about maternity leave a little bit. But when I read that tweet initially, mm -hmm. I thought to myself that one, I, I, I genuinely feel bad that you look back and that's the experience you had. Mm -hmm. But two, I thought to myself, where was I in all this? <laughs> because we, like I said, same place, yep. same institution at the same time. And my experience was not like that. Yeah. And we, and we socialize too. Like right. we, yeah, yeah, we weren't, so. we weren't sort of running no. completely independent no, of each we other. Were, we, we were in very similar circles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, let's start with the, mm -hmm. the maternity leave aspect. So what is it about maternity leave that led to this reflection? So um, I was in I was on maternity leave from May 2018 to April uh, 2019, and as a lot of other people who've been on maternity leave know, one of the things that immediately can kind of come up, and um, you know, especially in a situation like mine where I don't have family around here, um, it's it can be very isolating. So you know, for the first uh, part of maternity leave, my partner was home with me and, and it was the three of us. Uh, but once he went back to work, I realized that unless I did something, unless I was very proactive and did something about it myself, it was very easy to get into this kind of rut where you're in the same routine every day. And it's really easy, especially when you have a small baby. Um, at least it was easy for me to just stay at home and mm. not go out because going out can be a hassle. Right. You know, you have to get everything ready. Um, you know, you have to, depending on what you're doing, you might have to work it around a nap. You have to make sure, you know, you've thought about when the baby ate, when it needs to eat. And it's just, there can be a lot to think about. So when you start going down that path in your head, sometimes it's like, oh, well, I'll just stay home. Right. And so I sort of realized that I had to um, step back and look at that situation and say, okay, I realize I'm feeling kind of isolated. I'm, I'm not... Um, going out as much as I want to be and you know what can I do about that and then I you know made some changes and I, I reached out to some friends who also were on maternity leave at that time and we kind of set up a network but that process and thinking about that and coming to that realization is kind of what 
sparked that memory of grad school. Mm -hmm. And I will say before we have this discussion, um, certainly my tweet maybe sounded a bit more ominous than it was. There were parts of grad school that I really enjoyed and I certainly did socialize in grad school. As, As Sean knows, we went to a lot of the same social events, but there was still a large part of it that in my mind is, is reflected by that tweet. Yeah, and, and which is which is fair, right? So mm-hmm. one of the things that's part of that is the pressure mm-hmm. that you, you felt. Um, and, and I'm curious to know mm-hmm. where that pressure for you, and looking mm-hmm. back on it, where was it coming from? Was it internal pressure or was were there external forces around you you felt that were pressuring you to go home and work or to always be somewhere working? So that's a really great question. And the answer is that it's both. I would say probably the largest part of the pressure that I felt at that time was definitely uh, internal. And it's this idea that you, we have something big to create. I have, you know, supposedly a finite amount of time to work on it, although some people may argue with that. Um, But financially, you know, I had a finite amount of time to work on that. And there's this idea that it's so big and you have so much to do. Um, and you know, you see the people around you doing things, making progress, um, taking on other academic projects beyond their thesis, um, you know, having success, making progress at those things. And, you know, I was looking at that and thinking if, if I wanted to go out for an evening, it was like, okay, well, if I go out, what am I giving up? I'm giving up making progress on my thesis. I'm giving up maybe taking on another project. And, it was, a, it was a lot of kind of internal, I don't know what the right word is, but almost like, um, you know, slapping of my hand. Like I would be out somewhere and, right. and thinking, well, I shouldn't be here right now. I should be at home mm. working. So that was a lot, um, I guess a lot of the time it was very uh, internal. However, what drive or what drove that internal stress and anxiety about that were comments that I heard people make around me um, both other students other professors Uh, so you know I remember very distinctly having a conversation with someone because one of the things that I decided to do during uh, grad school just to manage my own stress and anxiety was I made a point uh, to you know go to the gym five days a week like Monday to Friday where I would go start the day at the gym you know get some adrenaline going and then go sit down and, and make some progress on my thesis And I remember discussing this with a colleague who said, that's not a good use of your time. You know, all that time that you're spending at the gym every morning, you could get up and use that time to write your thesis because you're fresh in the morning. And that's what probably when you could be making the most progress. So you shouldn't be managing your time like that. Like that's too much time to be spending away. And at the time, like that's a ridiculous comment. Looking back, that's a ridiculous comment to make, right? But at the time it fed into that anxiety that Mm. I already had. And I know other people had where it's like, oh, I'm not working hard enough. There's other people working harder than me. Right. So that fed into that anxiety and guilt. Also, um, you know, a lot of people in grad school, and I came into grad school with this idea, like, well, you treat it like a a Monday to Friday, nine to five job, you know, you're managing your own time, but as long as you put in that much time, like you'll be making progress and, you know, you'll have time to do other things. And I heard uh, two different professors during the first year I was, I was there saying, no, you'll have time to do things later in your life. This isn't like a nine to five job. You need to be living and breathing this, Mm -hmm. get through this, and then you know, you'll have time later on. So I did get into this mentality in grad school where it was like sacrificing, things would come up, social things, things with, um, you know, family. And I would say, sorry, I can't do that because I need to do this. But I'll like, we'll do something like in my head. I was like, we'll do something in the future. This will be better in the future. Right. So I spent a lot of time in grad school with this idea that like, I'm sacrificing this now, but it'll be okay down the road. Right. And foregoing things because of that. And now, again, not to paint the picture that I was a complete, completely <laughs> antisocial. Like, I definitely would go do things because I recognized for, you know, my own mental health. Like, I did need to spend time around other people and talk about things that were not, you know, my history degree or my thesis. But I didn't take advantage of those opportunities as often as I should have looking mm-hmm. back. I think if I had done more so, I would have... Um, alleviated a lot of the stress and maybe given myself a bit of a break. Uh, But the other thing is that when I did take those opportunities, a lot of the time because of the mindset I was in um, and this fear of not making enough progress, 
I wasn't able to 100% relax and enjoy it because even mm. though I might have been having a good time, I was enjoying time with my friends, the whole time I still had this thing in the back of my mind that was like, you know, you're not working on your thesis right now. You're, you, you're probably going to have to get up at like 5 a.m. tomorrow and, and do some extra work to make up for, mm. for not doing that now. And it was like that voice constantly right. sort of nagging me that like, is this the best use of your time? Like, did you really need to be here? Um, yeah, and that's not healthy. No. And no, no it's, it's definitely like, not healthy. Of course, definitely yeah. not healthy. Yeah. Um, you know, I had, I didn't start off in grad school having severe anxiety, but in the middle of grad school, I had severe anxiety and a lot of, um, you know, episodes of panic about things related to my thesis. And I kind of just sat in it because those voices and that fear of not of falling behind and not doing. Um, as much as other people were doing and not working as hard as them was, you know, it was really difficult and it's really overpowering and it's hard to just kind of say, oh, I'll just worry about this later and go have fun. Like, that's not where your mindset is at when you're thinking those things. Right. And it's it's funny because I know that other people had different experiences like yourself, like, you know, you've mentioned that, but I also know a lot of people that had the same experience as me. So it's right. it's it's hard to sort of looking back now and being in a different situation it's hard to understand how you know we let that happen mm -hmm. to ourselves but at the same time i i think there's a lot of things in the environment that reinforce that and i think that there's not a lot of at least when i was there there wasn't a lot of um cognizance among other people that those people were feeling those pressures and having that difficulty right yeah. and, and certainly i would have been one of those people that yeah. I, I wasn't cognizant <laughs> of it at all because for me, like I, I was very public about the yeah. fact that <laughs> if I was outside before noon or, or working before noon, something was horribly wrong. Oh, uh, we used to life, joke right? how yeah. I would be up probably. I was getting up in the morning probably not too long after you went to bed. Right. Yeah. Like I would stay up and I <laughs> yeah. would work. Like when I was when I was writing, I would get to the archives. I, I wrote on the second floor of the archives. I would get there yeah. between two and three, and they would kick me out at eight. And I'd be fine. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I like so for me, I never had this feeling of when I wasn't working that I should be working, right? Like mm -hmm. on days where, like, so I curl, right? Yeah. And and the rotation is you play at seven one week and nine the other week. Mm -hmm. So when I play at nine, my thing of work writing till eight was fine. Then they kick me out, and then I go to the curling club. When I play at seven, I would leave at six fifteen, mm -hmm. and I would actually get excited on those days. It was like <laughs> I get to leave earlier than I normally would, and so yeah. So my whole mindset was I really like what I'm doing, and what I liked the most about grad school was the freedom it allowed me to do <laughs> other things around it, right? Like in in sort of fun ways like with curling mm -hmm. or softball or whatever and doing those things uh, but also in more serious ways like when my grandmother was uh, diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. I went home uh, like six times one summer mm -hmm. uh, right and that was because I didn't have a nine to five yeah, job could. where I had to be right so I so it allowed me the freedom to do that mm -hmm. and that's why I always loved it I, I mean the I also like working independently mm -hmm. and, and sort of being in charge of what I'm doing on a, on a daily basis. So that certainly helps. Mm -hmm. But because of what my experience was, and I know, I, I really think that your experience is more common mm -hmm. based on everything that I've seen and that I've read <laughs> than mine. Part of me wonders, does grad school, do you think, attract people who are that type A, have to get everything or, or want to get everything done right away uh, and have that personality that makes them more vulnerable to these pressures to a comment that could be made that would then be internalized in, in a negative way is it is it simply just a product of who wants to do it or who even can do it based on grades and stuff like the people who get good grades are type a like generally yeah and they're the ones who could be vulnerable to this mental health problem I mean, I, I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but really? I mean, that's what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> but I think in my experience, yeah, like I always was very competitive in school and, you know, it was really important to me to do well and put my best foot forward. And if I felt like I hadn't put my best foot forward on something, um, particularly in undergrad, like I would get really upset with myself because I felt like, oh, that's, you know, that's an embarrassing paper I handed in because I didn't <laughs> try as hard as I should have, or I went out and did whatever instead, right? And it, you know, 
to be clear, like at that point, you know, in third or fourth year, like an embarrassing paper for me was probably something that I wouldn't be happy with, but other people may have been happy right, you get with. Right, eighty on it. Yeah, but for me, that was like humiliating, right? right. And so it was a lot of this internal. Um, I don't even know, like internal strife, I guess, right. just this desire. Almost shame, I don't like yeah. even. Like. But looking back at grad school, like part of me, um, grad school was the first time, I think, especially at the beginning, the first time I had experienced like imposter syndrome. Sure. And I think the rest of my grad school experience is really an extension of that because mm. it's this idea like, well, do I belong here if I'm not buckling down? Do I belong <laughs> here if I'm not like putting, yeah. you know, all my time into this? And looking back now, it's hilarious that I even got into that mindset because I, I would stress myself out so bad about sitting you know spending eight plus hours in front of a computer trying to write I was only productive for maybe two or three hours of that and the rest of the time I'd just be sitting there getting frustrated I would have been better off to you know go go for a walk go for a walk go see some people you know go for coffee even like do something else like play a video game or something like that but it's this idea that like this is part of the struggle we all have to go through this and if I don't go through this struggle like I'm not as good as everyone else who's going through this struggle and it's just because you get into that mindset and part of that mindset forces you to not be around other people and have Mm -hmm. conversations about that as much as you should you start to kind of be in it too much and think like this is this is legitimate like this is (laughs) this is real like this is a good way to think when now I'm on the other side of it and it's like oh my god and how many people are doing how many undergrads that's what really horrified me too like even younger um younger people like how many undergrads are sitting there alone like having those stresses and like no one knows because they're not around anyone to tell them and they're embarrassed they don't want to tell anybody like I think it's a real honestly I think it's a real crisis because no one you know I ended up talking to a few friends when I was in grad school that were going through the same thing and you know it was nice to know that I wasn't the only one but that knowing that other people were going through that in a way just like normalized it more. So it was like, this is part of it. We're going <laughs> right. to do it guys. We're going to get through it's right? Part of the struggle, but like it really shouldn't be. No. And there should be a lot more, I don't know. I don't know if outreach is the right word, but there should be a lot more um, openness about that and that that's not normal. And that yeah. it, even though a lot of people are going through that. Yeah. There, yeah. there should be some sort of training and it's interesting, yeah. right? So part of my job now is writing big, long papers right yeah and when i was writing the the dissertation if i got stuck i would get up and i would walk around Mm -hmm. and i would do whatever i'd go watch a stupid youtube video or something but now i sit at my desk and i feel like i can't do that because there are other people around yeah right and and (laughs) it's a monitoring system like oh wait like what do i do but i've gotten a lot better uh just getting up and leaving and just like and walking around because i need that to sort of process uh what i'm writing but yeah, when when you're in it, I, I it, it's so interesting just to have that different mm-hmm. experience. The other thing I'm, I'm wondering mm-hmm. is I am forever and will forever be an advocate of the two-year MA mm-hmm. with a thesis, courses, thesis. I will advocate mm-hmm. it forever. I did it. I thought it was super useful in teaching me not only how to write in chapters and to do a lot of archival research mm-hmm. with the purpose of turning it into sort of a narrative study of something you did the one year yeah. MA and I know a lot of faculty will advocate for the one year if you want to do a PhD yeah. that was the advice that you were given I know uh, and that was the advice that a lot of people around us were given mm-hmm. and I always when I, whenever I'm asked which is rarely <laughs> I always say two year if you want to do a PhD mm-hmm. do a two year learn to what the work on your own environment is like, Mm -hmm. figure out the ways to manage that. And then if you still at the end of that year have an interest (laughs) in a PhD, you have a better sense of what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's my argument in favor of the two year Mm -hmm. -year MA. And I'm I'm wondering, looking back, do you feel as though that would have made a difference for you? One year, two year, or or is it just sort of the situation? I don't think it would have, to be honest. I was probably more isolated in my one year MA than I was in my PhD. Okay. Frankly, for time, time management purposes, like, you know, three courses, TAing, like writing a major research paper and doing the archival research because it was really, you know, I, I wanted to do like robust archival research for that. And, um, yeah, I, I, I will say this unabashedly. I think <laughs> during my MA, I took two like Saturdays off completely. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I think I did work every other wow. day of that year. And that was not a healthy way to start, no, obviously. definitely not. But no. in a way that made my PhD, I think that set a tone where during my PhD, I was like, well, I've worked harder in the past. 
Like, mm. shouldn't... But, you know, you can't sustain that pace for, no. like... I barely sustained it for a year. Yeah. You can't sustain that pace for, like, five, six years, right? No. Um, but it, in my mind, set this unrealistic expectation. It's like, well, I know what you can do, so why... Mm. Well, you know, you should be doing that now kind of thing, right. right? Like, it's really... It's, like, messed up how your brain works <laughs> when you think this way, right? Right, but if you had... So, but So my argument there yeah. would be, or my case would be, is if you had done the two-year, it would have given you space to breathe potentially over that time because you wouldn't have had to cram as much into that first year maybe but I think in my case like I would have had to know in advance that I could give myself that space and I don't think I would have because Mm. I think going into my MA I was so you know I came from you know a small town in um, Vancouver Island and like you know had never been to like a big university or anything before and so I really did come here being like well what were these other people's educations like how am I going to keep up and so right from the beginning I don't think it mattered how much work I actually had I think I would have put in the same amount of time just to like cover my butt okay in turn like the way that I figured it so I I don't yeah I think that I don't know if it would have made a difference for me Hmm. yeah so for you in in looking back on it Mm -hmm. what was the point at which it started to turn then in in this way of like was it did you have these feelings during like comps was it just research was it right like at at what point do you feel as though this sort of hit the sort of the peak of of the negativity and and sort of where this became an issue it started towards the end of the second semester of comps so i finished all my comps in two semesters um wouldn't advise that to other people moving forward because i definitely uh, I think I could have benefited from taking another semester. Yep, I um, agree. I did, I, the had, sa- I did the same yeah. thing. This is where we came up with reading hangover. Yeah, it it's, is. It's, it's a true. Thing. It's a total thing. <laughs> so I had some. I had three fields, and two of which were very um, comprehensive. And uh, I was ambitious and thought, well, I'll get them done in in two semesters, and then I will have time to you know dig into my research over the summer and like really get going. Um, but the amount, like the volume I had to read for those comps, uh, because I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I don't know what it's like now, but in the program that I was in at the time, there wasn't really any consistency across re- the amount of reading required in each <laughs> comprehensive exam no, there or was each not. comprehensive field rather. No, or how so, fast you were going to go through so it. So I had one anything? field yeah. with like 50 books and I had one that had 250. So just to put some background there so trying to do three fields in two semesters was ambitious especially when it turned out that two of them had very deep comprehensive like theoretical reading lists and I got through it but I started in the second semester to get like mentally fatigued keeping up with the deadlines of meetings and making sure that I had dug into these books enough to feel comfortable speaking about them because again it's you know I want to make sure like I'm you know putting my best foot forward and so yeah I remember towards the end of the second semester I started to have that fatigue um I did the comprehensive exam I did really well so that's you know I achieved the goal that I wanted to achieve by putting myself through that (laughs) but yeah then as Sean mentioned um I went into what we call like severe reading hangover um, I was so exhausted. I literally spent two weeks on the couch, and I think that's the longest break I took for the rest of my PhD because right. I could, like, I couldn't function. I right. was so mentally and physically exhausted. Like, I just couldn't do anything for yeah. two weeks. Like, it's it was a crazy pace. So, definitely wouldn't do that in two <laughs> semesters again. I've told everyone I've spoken to since then take at least three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Def- yeah, so that's when three. it started. Yeah. And I would say I had about a year year and a half there that was like real bad where I started you know I was doing research and I was trying to get through stuff but I just got so stressed about keeping up and not only keeping up with the people around me but at that point I had done really well um you know with grades and scholarships and I felt like I had to keep up with myself Mm -hmm. so I felt like I had to keep up with the fact that I was getting you know a certain uh, level of achievement and so uh, that in itself was stressful. Like I sure. didn't want to be the person that started off at the top and then, 
you know, yeah. fell, fell off. <laughs> and so that in itself became very stressful to me. And so, yeah, there was about a year, year and a half there where I, I was doing stuff and I was making progress, but I was really struggling. And there were times where, you know, social things would come up and I would justify to myself that I couldn't do it. I had to keep working. And there were a few times where things came up and I would say, okay, I'm going to go, you know, go play board games for a night or, you know, go to like pub trivia. But it was really hard for me to let go and enjoy it because I still, yeah, I had that voice being like, okay, you know, you should get back and, and work. Um, eventually, once I started, um, you know, kind of realizing that the way I was feeling was a bit of an issue uh, and working in things like fitness, um, you know, we had really great uh, counseling and therapy here on campus. And so I took advantage of those resources. I was really able to organize it a bit better uh, for myself and kind of approach it a little bit differently. I was able to take force myself to take more time to socialize, but I still had that voice in the back. And to be honest, what ended up working for me, and this isn't the path for everyone, but I realized that maybe for me, um, it wasn't great to continue on full time because it was really hard for me to get out of this rut. So what I ended up doing was uh, seeking employment outside of the university and I switched to part time. And uh, that worked a lot better for me because once I acknowledged that I was part time and I wasn't under the same kind of stressful time limit of being a full time student and that I accepted, well, now I'm part time. So I have other things going on. You know, I have a career I'm building. Um, you know, eventually the part time work I, I took outside of the university turned into a, a full time career with the public service. So once I was able to do that, it was a lot easier for me to manage my work. And I actually made more progress and development on my thesis during the time I was a part-time student and working either part-time or full-time outside of the university because uh, I had these other releases and I had other things going on yeah. and it was it was a way to give myself permission not to spend 100% of time on my thesis right. and that was a lot healthier for me. I realized that wouldn't work for everyone but for me that's when things really came together. That's interesting, right? Yeah. That, that, that administrative change. Yeah allowed you mentally to, to make yeah. that shift and it's one of those things where yeah everyone sort of needs to figure out what it is that they they need to make it mm -hmm. okay to take breaks I, I it, it's strange to for me when I see stuff on Twitter when people mm -hmm. are saying the same thing like give yourself permission to take a break mm -hmm. um, and I, it makes me feel almost bad that I never felt the need to give myself permission. I just took a break. No, but that's right? good, Sean. That means you you came in with the right <laughs> attitude, right? <laughs> so, so, but but it also makes me wonder, like, yeah. what is, what are the best strategies then that, you know, I'm still somewhat involved yeah. in in uh, higher education. I, I don't deal with grad students frequently, but occasionally, I do. But most of my stuff was with undergrads and now with high school kids that I work with mm -hmm. as well. I'm wondering, you know, what do you think? is the best way that we could approach this mm -hmm. uh, as as educators and even as someone, I, I would assume some of the people on Twitter who follow you, mm -hmm. uh, people who you talk to even in the public service would know your background, know mm -hmm. your experience, would ask for advice and have questions. What do you think is a, a effective strategy to set people up so that they can be successful and that it doesn't get to the point where they have to seek out these resources, mm -hmm. they're given the tools and the skills necessary to deal with the pressures because the pressures of grad school mm -hmm. they're always going to be there to some extent right and it, and it should be rigorous yeah right but we want to make sure that people before they get into it are set up for success and to be able to deal with those rigors so, absolutely so I'm, I'm just curious like what sort of so I, 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 I don't know how to do that so um, I think um, if if someone had told me or if it had been more public um, you know at the beginning when I started. If someone had just said, um, you know, I, I look back at it now and, and here's how I look at it. Everyone has, imagine you have a pie, okay? I have a pie in and, my fridge right yeah, now. Yeah, and your pie is made up of various pieces. And so when I was a grad student coming in, I had started off, 100% of my pie was being a grad student. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't made room for any other pieces. So mentally it was like, well, if it doesn't fit in what I've allocated, which is 100% of my pie being for grad school, being a student, then it's not fair for me to do that. It's not a good idea. Like right. I'm cheating. I'm not working as hard as I should be. If someone had told me that it was okay to have some other pieces in the pie at the beginning, that would have really helped me know that, okay, it's okay to go, you know, spend a weekend with my in-laws or like right. it's okay to you know have something going on a few nights of the week mm -hmm. to decompress uh, so I think it's really important that 
that's part of the messaging, right? When you come into grad school, some people already know that you knew that I didn't know that. Right. And so I needed someone else to validate yeah. that and, and let me know that that was okay. And I know other people would have benefited for, benefited from that message too. What changed for me is when I started working was I was forced to kind of reallocate my pie. So it was like, okay, well now I have this, I have work, um, you know, eventually it was like, okay, I'm having a baby. Right. So, you know, the pie, the composition of the pie changed for me necess- like out of necessity. And it needed, I think that needed to happen for me to be successful in the end because it was, you know, the permission that I needed to be like, okay, well, I, you know, I've allocated now 30% of my pie to being a student, right. you know, and, and the rest to work and, you know, family and whatnot. And I think that messaging at the beginning from an external source would have been really helpful because when I started, that messaging wasn't anywhere to be found. And, you know, you're surrounded by people who, um, some of which who also have imposter syndrome, I think probably more people than admit it. Oh, and everyone has Everyone. It. And a everyone. lot of, everyone's competing, you know, at the beginning because everyone wants to make sure they don't come off as like the dumb person that doesn't right. belong there. So people are, you know... They're overstating and saying, well, I do this and I never take breaks and da, da, da. And so that's a really unhealthy place for us to start off our journey in grad school. And so we need to insert some messaging in there that uh, just highlights the importance of being multifaceted. And again, grad school should still take up a big chunk of your pie because it is rigorous, as you said. And it's something that, you know, you do need to devote a lot of time to. But it doesn't have to be 100 percent and it shouldn't be 100 percent because that's not healthy right yeah. I, I completely agree yeah it shouldn't be all if, if what you are as mm-hmm. a human being as a grad student and that's it yeah that is problematic yeah right? you absolutely. should you should have other elements to what your life mm-hmm. is uh and, and it could be something as simple as like for me i would curl and play basketball mm-hmm. right there were times in my first year during comps i would play basketball monday nights and curl on thursday nights there were times where i wouldn't speak to another human being in between those in times. between those yeah. two <laughs> things but that was in part because i was new to the city yeah and right with no classes to go yeah. to i didn't really know what to do mm-hmm. so but you know you learn and, and you develop but one of the things that i i think should be done and I mean, I do it in a very simplistic way in my classes. When we get to reading weeks mm-hmm. or long weekends, I say at the end of the class, like, take time next week or, yeah. or like, just don't worry about school. And that's, I just say that to the students. I don't think, I don't know if any of them listen to me. <laughs> um, but I, like I say that, but I also think that for any incoming grad student, I think that there should be, you know, when you go to a job, yeah. the first day at least, they take you around and they show you what this job is like. Um, you know, what time you have to be there, what time you have to leave, dress code, Mm -hmm. all those things. I think the first week of grad school should be, this is what being a grad student is like. (laughs) You should be trained on what it is. And part of that needs to be work-life balance in in part of that training. Because when you just show up out of an undergrad Mm -hmm. and they're like, congratulations, you're a grad student now. What does that mean? Like, yeah, Yeah. what what does that mean? Well, to use a government term, what you're saying is we need to do a better job of onboarding. Our, yeah. <laughs> our students into graduate yes. school um, because we're not giving them the tools and showing them what what is not you know there's a wide range of normal but there's also very clear what's not normal and I think right. we need to set those boundaries yes. right at the beginning yeah and part of it too yeah. is when you when you transition from being an undergrad to a grad mm-hmm. uh, student depending on programs and schools mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff but generally speaking you're going to be dealing with undergrad mm-hmm. students at that point so if the grad student doesn't or isn't been put in a position to successfully manage their workload Mm -hmm. and stress level and all that how can they then be there to support undergraduate students to do the same thing well and if anything like I worry about downloading unreal expectations to the people coming after you right and you're just perpetuating that you know I, I kind of cringe because I, I know several times when people were asking questions about uh, grad school and they were like, so what do you do? What What is doing comps like? And I was like, oh, well, I have one field that I had to read 250 books in like X amount of weeks. And right. da, da, da. and I think I probably scared some people <laughs> off and I feel bad about that now. But at the time, that was my reality, right? right? Because I didn't know otherwise. So, you know, it's that's the kind of downfall of not preparing people. Yeah. And, and, and so I think faculty have a role to yeah, play because I've heard faculty faculty say well this is the way I did it Mm -hmm. and just because the way you did it 
was it necessarily healthy mm -hmm. doesn't mean that that should continue just the, the fact that you survived it and managed to get through it doesn't mean that we have to perpetuate that oh no forever. and like I mean, I'll say when I decided to switch to part time and start working and, and eventually working full time, I got a lot of flack from a few people, like from a couple of professors and other students saying, well, like you're you're just going to quit. You're going to you know, you're going to give up like this is just the first step to that. Maybe for some people, that's kind of how it starts. And if that is the choice they choose, that's completely legitimate. Maybe it's not for some people. But for me, um, it actually ended up being the best thing I could do. And I, like I said, I was actually able to maintain the level of academic achievement I wanted and had started off with by making that choice. Um, so every, like, every path for every person and what's right for them is, is going to be different. But I think just recognizing that there are different and valid paths that people can choose depending on their circumstance. There isn't a one size fits all for, for what works mm -hmm. for someone for grad school. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and this is, it's the thing too, like I got a lot of pushback when I started doing this show, yeah. for instance, people said, what are you doing? This is, yeah. a wa this is a waste <laughs> of your time. And Maybe it was a waste of my time. I don't know. <laughs> but it was a fun waste of my time. Right? Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed doing the show. It was yeah. always fun to, to talk to people. And I feel as though it made me better mm -hmm. as a historian just because it gave me a sense of what people are working on. Mm -hmm. right? It gave me a better sense of the current state of work. Right? It's easier to do historiography because stuff's published. It's harder when you're talking with people as they're doing the project. Of course, yeah. So it's, so it's a lot of fun. And But again, when people would say to me, oh, this is a waste of time, whatever I would just be like all right I'm like that's nice mm -hmm. right and I I wish that I could this is going to sound really self-aggrandizing but I really wish I could uh, that other people had that mm -hmm. ability like because whenever I say that people are like really like you can just do that well and, no and and you know what I know exactly what you mean like geez. It's a big day here on the University yeah. of Ottawa planes and souped up cars uh, <laughs> all the things are happening here no, but the, I, I completely understand what you're saying because I have that skill now. Right. I didn't have it then, but I wish that I could go back and tell myself right. and, and give myself that skill. But, you know, it's something I learned. And now, you know, I have it in my mind very clear how much time I allocate for the different things I have going on. And, you know, if someone were to say, well, that's not a good use of your time, it, it rolls off my back because right. they don't know me and, and my life and what I have going on right? right but that was a skill that I definitely did not have then and I think a lot of people don't and it's you know I was lucky I learned it with time but um, it sure would have been nice to have that back then <laughs> <laughs> um, so fundamentally yeah. do you think uh, it's sort of getting into mm -hmm. th something you said in the tweet is grad school at least sort of the way we experience mm -hmm. it here is it fundamentally an unhealthy place or is it more a situation where we have to do a better job of recognizing the flaws in the system? I think it's a, a job. A job. It's a place it, where it we need. A job, I mean. It's a place where we definitely need to do a better job of recognizing um, some flaws in the system and, and doing a bit better to equip people to, to handle, um, you know, how grad school is currently structured. Uh, but I also think that depending on the person going in for someone who has the um, sort of mindset that I had or maybe any underlying anxiety issues or, or other mental health issues um, which I didn't realize I had until I was put in this situation um, it can be a really as it currently is it can be a really unhealthy place because I mean as evidence like someone who just by the difference between you and me like as someone who had those issues and someone who didn't like we experienced it very differently yep. and so I think it it you know, it does run the risk of being an inherently unhealthy place for some people. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that it can't become a healthy place. I think, like you've said, we just need to do a better job of recognizing that it's it's not one size fits all. Everyone's coming in with a different situation, different story, and we need to recognize that people need different things um, and that different paths to get to the, the same goal are completely valid and okay um you know if i had heard more at the beginning about you know oh you can go part-time you can work you can do mm -hmm. this you can go full-time like those options and that they were all you know okay yep. that would have really helped too but you don't hear that right. at the beginning so yeah i think i think better orientation mm -hmm. to where you Absolutely. are i mean the two schools that i have graduate degrees from mm -hmm. i felt like i showed up and they were like go ahead yeah <laughs> and that was that was basically it. i don't Same. i don't yeah. really mean that to be overly critical it, mm -hmm. the orientation sessions that were were more about 
mm-hmm. here's the structure yeah. of what your program is. And I was like, I, I've already signed up for this. I've read this stuff. Yeah, right? exactly. You want to know more about the yeah. actual reality of what it is. So if mm-hmm. we could prepare people, like you say, for that, mm-hmm. I think we would all be better off. And, and I think as a discipline, too, we would get better material produced, right? Like if mm-hmm. people are working in healthy environments, they're apt to produce perhaps better stuff. Maybe, yeah. Right? Like maybe, I don't know. I think so. And I think recognizing from the bat that like it's okay to go to grad school and not become a professor after, like if you yeah. decide that's not for you, if you want to go do something else with your history degree, if you want to get your PhD and do something that has nothing to do with history after, like that, that's cool. those, all those skills are still valid and that's like totally cool. And a lot more positive reinforcement of those different sort of post degree options and what's acceptable um i think that's really important too because as we know there's not enough jobs for everyone to become a professor so we need to start placing value on those other options yes for sure and and that's something within the academy too that needs to change is uh, within faculty but at the same time too i I saw a tweet today like why do faculty members think there's just unlimited museum and archive I saw jobs that one too. too. Yeah. It's like, you know, so the, it's a recognition that yeah. the, the outside job market is tough too. It, it is. It's, it it's, is. It's, it's tough. And, and as you say, um, I, I think anyone who goes to grad school has to also be okay with the idea of not finishing. Mm-hmm. I, I really believe that. I, it yeah, never. I, it never occurred to me that if 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 I got a dream job, I would have like. I always said I would have left. Like, yeah. I'm okay with not finishing. And as I was doing, I would say I don't have this ego where mm-hmm. I need to finish. I don't think it's an ego thing, a need to finish. I, I don't know what it is, but I don't think it's an ego <laughs> thing. Uh, but, yeah, yeah it, like, it's okay to leave. It right? is okay it, to leave. If it gets you into a better position in a healthier yeah. state, like, that's okay. If There's it's, nothing if wrong it's with not it. adding any value to you at a certain point, then, then let it leave. go. Yeah. Let it go. It's okay. So, uh, so Madeline, thank you very much oh, thank for you. coming uh, and sharing mm-hmm. your experience with me. Um, it, it, it's been interesting to, to talk and, and realize that, again, same place, same time, uh, different experiences. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, so and I, I think that's an important message for everyone to understand. Yeah. It's yeah. a personalized experience and, yeah. uh, you know, live it and experience it in the way that is best and healthiest for you Mm -hmm. and do whatever it is you need to be in the best position possible yeah absolutely and that's sort of the i guess that's the thesis of this show (laughs) the thesis of today (laughs) of the show (laughs) um so if you'd like you can follow madeline on twitter mad klosk or klosky the e is there yeah Uh, so m-a-d-k-l-o-s-k-e yes uh, at mad klosky Uh, you can find her there you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. You can, of course, as always, email the show HistorySlam at gmail.com. And as always, check out ActiveHistory.ca. Uh, some interesting stuff over the past couple of weeks uh, related to the election and personalities and all that kind of stuff. So uh, not partisan one way or the other, just looking at the role of personality in, in politics, which I found very interesting. So uh, definitely check that out. And thank you all for joining us. We will be back in a couple weeks with another new episode. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.